All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Google Search Central SEO Office Hours. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I'm a search advocate on the search relations team here at Google. And part of what we do are these office hour hangouts where people can jump in, ask their questions around search, and we can try to find some answers. A um, bunch of stuff was submitted already on YouTube, so we can go through some of that. But uh, like always, I, I think it's always neat to start with uh, live questions. Anything from your side, anyone who wants to get started? Yeah, I would like to ask the first question. OK, go for it. Um, my name is Vahan. I'm an IT director of Search Engine Journal. And uh, one uh, question I have about Core Web Vitals is, uh, is there a possibility that Google can start <laughs> revise that score in Webmaster uh, quicker? Like, uh, I did updates on the website and have found that Core Web Vitals are broken after like 20 days because it's updating uh, uh, in a weeks, right, in, <clears throat> in in long period. So, and I have fixed that, but it will take another couple of weeks to have that fixed. Is there a possibility that Google can review and make those updates uh, more quicker? Like not like 28 days, but a couple of days. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I doubt it. Um, because the, the data that we show in Search Console is based on the Chrome user experience report data, which is aggregated over those 28 days. So that's, that's the primary reason for the delay there. It's not that Search Console is slow in processing that data or anything like that. It's just uh, the way that the data is collected and aggregated, it, it just takes time. Uh, so usually what, what I recommend uh, when, when people ask, ask about this kind of thing, where it's like, I, I want to know early when something breaks, uh, is to make sure that you run your own tests on your side uh, kind of in parallel for your important pages. And uh, there are a bunch of third-party tools that do that for you automatically. You can also use the, the PageSpeed Insights API directly and pick, I don't know, a, a small sample of your important pages and just test them every day. And uh, that way, you can kind of tell if there are any regressions in, in any of the setups you made uh, fairly quickly. It, Obviously, a lab test is not the same as the field data. So there, there is a bit of a difference there. Uh, but if you see that the, the lab test results are stable for a period of time, and then suddenly they go really weird, then that's, that's a strong indicator that something broke in, in your layout, in your, in your pages somewhere. Thank you. Now, quick follow-up uh, there, then. Sure. Um, so John, th uh, does that th mean that if I um, see that I have really bad poor core web items and manage to fix most of those issues in, in one day, um, the next day that would be, uh, or rather two days later, that would be part of these 28 days? Because that would, would it be a rolling update, or is it every 28 days that it happens? So I. I don't know for sure. I think the, the Chrome uh, user experience report site has that documented. I'm, I'm not sure if it's, okay. it's like All a right. batched update that is just done every 28 days or if it's more of a rolling thing. I know in Search Console, okay. we have kind of the, the overtime data, and it's not that it jumps every 28 days. So my guess is it's probably more rolling. All right, I will check that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So it could uh, still take 28 days to fully so after one day, you're one twenty eighth of the way there to seeing, yeah, what the results are, which is yeah. why you yeah. suggest doing your own test manually. Yeah, exactly. But that makes web development very expensive as well. It it makes things harder. Yes. No. I um, I mean it's it's not that that we're trying to make things harder. It's just uh, the way that this data is collected in Chrome. It it just takes time to be aggregated. So just to uh, know everybody, uh, what did broke the Core Web Vitals score? Since something was updated on the Core Web Vitals calculations, 
since it's since beta. So where we, where we were hiding the navigation menu sticky when you scrolled down and it show uh, when you scroll up <laughs> and used CSS like uh, position to animate that, like hide it. Uh, and seems that position animations <laughs> did spoil the core web vitals. So if, even though it's a sticky menu and it's not causing layout to shift, but it's calculated as a layout shift because you are animating the position of the element. So we did change that uh, animation from position to opacity. Like we are, we are just uh, fading out it instead of uh, moving uh, <coughs> away from the screen by position animation. Yeah, the, the cumulative layout shift is sometimes, I, I think, tricky to interpret and figure out what, what exactly is, is causing issues there. Yeah. Yeah, because in the past it wasn't causing. Our web vitals were like all green, right? In one day I found that everything is in red. <laughs> what could kill, cause that? And I have found that just our TSS position animations, which even don't cause the layout shift, are contributing into uh, layout shift calculations. Yeah, I I think for for things where you feel that uh, the calculations are are being done in a way that doesn't make much sense, I I would also get in touch with the the Chrome team. I I think especially Annie Sullivan is working on improving the cumulative layout shift uh, side of things, and uh, just make sure that. Like they they see these kind of examples, and if you run across something where you say, "Oh, it doesn't make any sense at all," then make sure that they know about it. Uh, it's not so much that from Google search side, we we would try to dig in and figure out exactly why this is happening with that score, but we kind of need to rely on the score uh, from the Chrome side, and. Our goal with the Core Web Vitals and page experience in general is to update them over time. Uh, so I think we, we announced that we wanted to uh, update them maybe once a year and let people know ahead of time what, what is happening. Uh, so I, I would expect that to, to be improved over time. Uh, but it's also important to, to get your feedback in and make sure that they're aware of these weird cases. Thank you. Sure. All right. Hi, John. Yeah. Yes, you raise your hand. Perfect. Exactly. Great. Yeah. So uh, you know, our website consists of uh, a lot of like thousands of guides that uh, we made to help people understand visa requirements based on their location. And the way we've designed these guides are that they're meant to be a one-stop destination. But that said, some of the content is overlapping, and there's a risk that Google might interpret these pages as doorway pages, even though that's not our intention. For example, like we have a guide for France Visa in Los Angeles and then France Visa in Detroit, uh, and it's personalized to the city, but a lot of the content is uh, also like similar. Uh, and so, uh, you know, what is your advice to make sure it's not interpreted as doorway or canonicalized by Google? Uh, given that we have so many of these? Um, I don't know. It's it's hard to say. So off, offhand, just hearing that you have city-level pages for visa advice feels a lot like you're headed into the direction of doorway pages. So that's something where I, I would be really cautious about uh, expanding too much in that direction, uh, because obviously you're going to have things like, well, all of the country information is exactly the same. And essentially, the difference is the address and maybe a telephone number opening hours. And that's something where I suspect our systems, on the one hand, could be getting confused from the, the content side, and where probably if someone from the web spam team were to look at that, they would say this is potentially too much, uh, especially if if you really have, like, on, on a city level, uh, countrywide information, that feels like you could easily expand that to 10,000s of cities. 
and claim that it's it's like all unique content because it's for every city individually. And I have some kind of basic information about each city as well on those pages. But in, in the end, it's all about one country and the visas for the other country, right? So that's something where I I would try to take a strong look at what you can do to try to concentrate those pages so that you don't end up in a situation where you're just taking giant list of cities, giant list of countries, and then crossing them in a database and generating pages. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, and then just a follow-up question. Uh, so we'll definitely look into it. Uh, we uh, So uh, across like all the pages that we have, Google's indexed OB, uh, only about 100 of them. And the primary reason uh, when I look at the crawl stats report is that Google only crawls about 60 pages. and all the other pages are excluded, like discovered but not uh, crawled, which means that they didn't want to overload our website. Uh, but we have like a full success rate and really low response time. So how would you suggest we go about getting uh, the crawl budget up? Yeah, so there, there are two aspects there with the crawl budget. On the one hand, kind of the technical limitations of the server. And on the other hand, the demand from Google with regards to what we think is important to index. And it sounds like the technical limitations on your server are less, less of an issue. If you're saying like it's, it's a fast server, it responds quickly, then primarily what you're probably seeing is that Google is running into a situation where it's saying, well, I don't know how useful these pages actually are. And uh, that's something that Google can learn over time. Uh, but it's, it's not something that you can force. And even if you can force it for uh, like a temporary situation where Google goes off and indexes tens of thousands of pages from your site, if then it still determines, well, act actually, this site is not as useful as I thought it was, then it will just drop those pages from the index over time. Uh, so assuming this is still the, the visa level site, mm -hmm. then that's right. something where I, I would strongly recommend starting off with a much smaller set of pages, uh, a much smaller set of content so that it's something that Google can index. Google can learn over time that, actually, this is really good content. And based on that, it can expand and say, well, actually, OK, instead of just 100 pages, I'll go and crawl 1,000 pages or go and crawl 10,000 pages and try to get those indexed as well. Uh, but kind of especially when you're starting off with, with a site that has a lot of content, potentially, I would try to find a way to decrease the size so that you can grow and become strong first and then expand to showing more content. Awesome. Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah. Hi, John. Hi. Hi. So uh, this is Ramender. I have a question regarding uh, sitemaps, which is uh, similar to the previous discussion. So uh, we have a new site, and we have older sitemaps, like ranging from 2009, 2005, till 2015, say. And we're facing some some of the sitemaps do have uh, certain issues, like images. Your image URLs have migrated, and because of that, we're getting issues in the older sitemap. So just wanted to check with you how important are the older sitemaps uh, since for the bot and since uh, we feel it's already archived in that case. And secondly, does it help the crawl budget by removing the older sitemaps? Yeah, uh, good, good question. So with, with regards to sitemaps, we use that to better understand which pages we need to crawl and, and update. And if you know that you have sitemap files that point to pages that don't exist anymore or that you don't care about anymore, then essentially I, I would try to remove those pages. So uh, if, if this is a sitemap file that was useful, I don't know, a couple of years ago, and your website has migrated in the meantime, you have a different URL structure, then telling us about those old URLs doesn't give us any useful information. Uh, so I would consider regenerating the sitemap files and really making sure that they contain the current set of URLs from your website that you care about. And that's less a matter of crawl budget, I think, um, but more just kind of like general website hygiene in that you're making sure that Google understands what you care about and is able to process that as easily as possible. OK. Got my answer. Thank you. Sure. 
Um, yeah. Mohawk, I think. Uh, you already you already answered my question. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Emre. 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 Okay. Perfect. Uh, okay. So recently we implemented uh, structured data for voice search, like speakable structured data, and we would like to uh, understand like what will be the impact. And uh, is there any way that we can somehow understand uh, that? what percentage of the traffic come from the voice search or is there any trick that we can use to extract this information from the search console? I, I don't think you can see anything with regards to, to voice search there at the moment. So that's, that's something people have asked about on and off, um, not for a long time now, but uh, it, it, every now and then. Um, but uh, I, I don't think there is anything in Search Console that gives information about how the speakable markup is used or when that's shown. So it's almost something that you'd probably have to try out yourself and see, is it doing what you think it's doing, or is it not, not that useful? OK, uh, thank you. And I have another question. Sure. It's about like, how we can uh, force Google to refresh the resources. I mean, the like the cache, resources cache. Like, for example, like if we change something uh, with our JavaScript file or, I don't know, the CSS or something like this, how we can force Google to refresh this file? OK, so you mean with regards to rendering the page or with regards exactly, to? Exactly, because we had an issue, and the page was returning emp like empty page because mm -hmm. of this caching issue. So we, let's say, redeployed the site, and we saw that like, Google continued to use the old uh, JavaScript file. So what we can do about this? I mean, to force uh, yeah. Google not to refresh the okay. cache. Um, I, I don't think you can easily force it to refresh that. But, but there are two things you can do. Uh, one, one is to serve the files with uh, the appropriate caching headers. Uh, so that Google knows approximately how long it could be cached. It's a bit tricky there, because the caching that we do for rendering is very different from the caching that a browser usually does for, for users. So it's, it's helpful, but it's not the, the perfect solution. Uh, the other thing that I've seen people do is to update the URLs when they make significant changes within the content. Uh, so I, I have seen some that use something like a content hash in the URL for, for the JavaScript files, for the CSS files. And in general, when we try to render an HTML page and we see a link to a new JavaScript file, uh, which would be based on the content hash, for example, uh, then we would know that, oh, we, this is a new JavaScript file. We need to take a look at it. Whereas if you keep the same file names for JavaScript and CSS, then we might be tempted to just reuse our cache. OK, thank you. Sure. Uh, Esther, I think you're next. Hey, John. Oh, wait. Hi. 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 Um, I, we're currently um, conducting a large site migration um, after our company was acquired by another company. So we're basically lifting and shifting some pages over to our website amongst our existing content and changing the domain. Um, are there any top five tips on what I should look out for whilst I'm doing this? Um, yeah, I, I think the, the most important part is really to track the individual URLs uh, so that you have a clear map of what previously was and what it should be in the future. And based on that, on the one hand, to make sure that uh, you have all of the redirects set up properly. Uh, so the, the various tools that you can use to kind of submit the list of the old URLs and check to see that they redirect to the right new ones. Uh, the other thing I would watch out for is all of the internal linking, uh, so that you really make sure that all of the internal signals that you have as well, that they're forwarded to whatever new URLs. Uh, because what 
sometimes happens, or what I've sometimes seen with these kind of restructurings, is that you redirect the URLs, you move them over, but you forget to uh, set the rel canonical. You forget to set the links in the navigation or in the footer somewhere. And all of those uh, other signals there, they, they wouldn't necessarily break the navigation, but they make it a lot harder for us to pick the new URLs as canonicals. Uh, so that's kind of the effect that you would see there. It's not so much that it would stop ranking, but it's more that, oh, we just keep the old URLs for much longer than we actually need to. OK, brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Hi, John. Hi. Well, let, me, um, let me just grab the next one in the list and I can get back to you. Uh, Dwayne? Well, no issues. Hi, John. Thank you. Uh, so we're rethinking um, how we display our uh, publication dates on site, on the front end. And uh, I wanted to know what the official stance is on whether we need to have both the publish date and update date, our last modified date, to comply with structured data. I know that most of structured data requires that you have some visible element that's marked up. So I just kind of want to see what you think is best there. Uh, we, we have a Help Center page on, on dates. I, I would double check that. I don't think it's necessary to, to specify any date in structured data. Uh, so if you give us some date information, that helps us to better understand it. Usually, what happens with regards to dates is we try to pick a date that is relevant for the page. And we do that based on the structured data that you have on the page, but also based on things like what, what is on the page itself. Uh, so as much as possible, like, like a lot of SEO signals, I think it's important to make sure that all of these things align. Uh, that uh, if you're giving us a date in one place, that it's actually a date that's visible on the page, uh, that the time zone is correct that you specify there, uh, all of these kind of small details as well, just that it matches the other information that we find. OK, yeah. The reason we are rethinking this is because we're seeing that sometimes you know, we aren't seeing the proper uh, modification date showed up in search. Um, so we want to be able to have that work properly. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's our, our systems kind of work in a way that we pick up all of the dates that we can find for this piece of content, and then we try to figure out which ones kind of match up the best. And based on that, we, we try to pick the right date. And uh, sometimes if you have, I don't know, a news site, then you'll have uh, related articles or things like that where you'll ha also have dates kind of mentioned in the text. And uh, if we don't find clear information in the structured data for the date, then we might pick one of these other random dates on the page as well. OK, can I just follow up one more, one time, one more time on that? So how does Google decide to, to show the last modification date? Does it need to reflect a significant change on the page? Um, or is there something else I need to think about? Um, I, I don't think we have any specific guidelines on when you should change the date. But uh, for, for practical reasons, I, I would try to do it then when you have significant changes on the page. Uh, so it's not like I just swapped an ad out in the sidebar kind of thing. But really, if it's in the primary content and you made some significant changes, then that feels like something that you'd want to flag there for, for users as well. Oh, yeah, not necessarily me changing the publication date, but will Google then pick up the modification date if I made the substantial change versus just showing me the publication date? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know how we decide between publication date and last modification date. Um, I'm not, not really sure how. how you'd be able to easily influence that. I could imagine that we try to see when significant changes happen on a site but or on a page. But I don't think we have any explicit guidelines on that. OK, thank you so much. Sure. Hi, John. Hi. Hi, this is Mithya Bas. Again, I am here with a very simple, basic question as I uh, started learning SEO. 
so this time my question is related to headings heading structure basically uh, is it mandatory that we should uh, uh, structure our headings in uh, ascending order or we can leverage uh, the structure as per our need um it's it's not necessary to to have kind of this theoretically correct order of the headings and uh, the number of like h1 headings that you have is also something that is just kind of open um i i think for a large part it makes sense to try to have a semantically correct heading structure um because there, there are things like screen readers that also rely on headings to kind of navigate to the right part of the page uh so it, it certainly makes sense to try to to get that but i wouldn't see it as something where you would see significant changes in seo if you change the order of your headings another question is uh, related to h1 tags how what's the optimal or ideal numbers of h1 tag we can have uh, in a page because uh, uh, i have read so many articles of industry expert that there should be only one h1 tag uh, from the perspective of seo so what does you recommend you can have as many as you want so uh, i i think in many cases you have one primary heading but uh, if you have multiple that's fine uh, with html5 it's also the case that by design in html you have multiple h1 tags uh, so it's it's something where there's definitely not a hard limit uh, with regards to the number of primary heading tags i think from a um kind of a focus point of view that you have a clear focus on your page it makes sense to have one primary topic uh but that can be something that you highlight in other ways it could be like it doesn't necessarily need to be the h1 tag uh it could be something that you have like with a big big title or if this is your home page then like maybe you have other ways of structuring what what you think is the primary topic of the page so can i say google uh, gives the importance uh, on the basis of its uh, structures of headings to the content um to to some extent it's not not only that uh but it it does help us to understand what you think is important for the page and if you say well this is the primary heading for my page and what this page is about and we see it matches what you have in your content then that's that's always useful for us to know thank you sure. and rob you're so patient am i am i though um so can you can you give us your current take on the supported image types for the core web vitals and page speed because you guys still seem to be recommending file types that you don't actually support or are not really the optimal image types to use uh, and i say that because when i when i look at our pastebees insights scores they seem to be fine you know we can save 0.15 seconds on javascript 0.9 seconds on deferring off screen images but we can save 12 seconds by changing the file types to image types like jpeg xp or jpeg 9000 abc that you don't even support so can you clarify that i i haven't seen that so mm. it's it's hard for me to say i can share uh, my screen um maybe not uh <laughs> no i i mean just just because like since we're talking about images and things uh i don't want it to suddenly be like oh it's like you're showing copyrighted images on your youtube uh thing so that's that's the prim primary thing i'm a little bit worried about uh but if if you want to drop your url in the chat like the the one that you're looking at then i i can take a look at that afterwards it's just our uk homepage which oh, okay. i'm sure the you homepage. know okay um but yeah. but in particular the the type because i there's we have no problem updating the image to a, a file type that you like but why is that still the recommended file type when you don't you guys don't really support jpeg 2000 i don't know it, it feels like we should support that like you're <laughs> you're does, saying we it? don't support it in image search or 
Well, for as far as I know, and our developer, and whenever you search it, Chrome doesn't support JPEG 2000, but recommends it as the recommended file type to speed up okay. your pages. That seems, it seems kind to of be an conflicting mix. information. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, but it might be also a sign that uh, the, there are other image optimizations that you could do to decrease the file size. Uh, but it's, it's but it does. It never mentions file size; just type. They're all PNG, which yeah, or JPEG. Yeah, JPEG two thousand. That seems like forever ago. Okay, <laughs> um, I, I'll take a look at that. Interesting. Cool. Okay, let me okay. run through some of the submitted questions, and then we'll have more time for for questions from you all along the way as, as well. Um, I'm managing one of the biggest news sites in our country. I want to improve internal linking for news, and I'm thinking about including latest news section in the sidebar so that the latest articles are linked not only from the home page but also from most pages on the site as well. Is this a good approach, or is only linking from the home page enough uh, that uh, these uh, whoops, enough, and those sidebar links uh, won't necessarily move the needle or pass additional value. Um, usually, this is a, a good approach. Like if, if they're new or important pages on your website and you link to them from across the rest of your website, then that helps us to better understand that you care about those pages and you want them to be crawled and indexed as quickly as possible. Usually, when it comes to news sites, uh, we focus a lot of our crawling on the news sitemap that you have and on so-called hubs, which are usually uh, the, the home page, the category pages, pages that we can refresh very quickly uh, where you link to the individual news articles. So probably for a, a reasonably sized news site, we should be able to pick up all of the new content that way already. So it's more a matter of kind of giving us a, a signal for the importance of those other pages. Uh, so that's something where if you think that these new articles are not performing as well in search as they could be, then linking to them like this probably makes sense. Uh, if you have other articles that you care about, uh, that you want to be more visible in search, and that could be something that is older, it could be something uh, that maybe is a cause that, that your site cares about, maybe it's important information that you need to share for the long run, then I would definitely also include that in something like a sidebar or footer links. So I think overall it's, it's a reasonable strategy. I think especially for non-news websites, it definitely makes sense. So if it's an e-commerce site, for example, and if you have new products or related products, you link to those in the sidebar. That's a fantastic way for us to, to get that information. For news site, we probably can already find those pages in other ways. And it's more about giving a subtle hint of importance. Uh, what's the best practice for anchor text wording on internal links as well as external links? Uh, for example, using the website name, the blog post title, exact match, or LSI keywords. Um, so first of all, we, we have no concept of LSI keywords. So that's something you can completely uh, ignore. Uh, I, I think it's interesting to look at LSI when you're thinking about uh, understanding information retrieval as a theoretical or computer science topic. But as an SEO, you probably don't need to worry about that. Uh, with regards to internal links, you're giving us a si signal of context. So basically, you're saying, in this part of my website, you'll find information about this topic. And that's what you would use as the anchor text uh, for those internal links. Uh, so that's something where, on the one hand, usually that's something that you want to kind of give that context to users as well. So the kind of internal links. Oops. Uh, the kind of internal links uh, that you would use for, uh, for users usually match what you would use for SEO as well. So that's something where, luckily, there's a nice overlap there. Um, with regards to external links, uh, if you're linking out to other people's websites, the same thing. It's like, it supplies some context why people should 
go and click on this link, what kind of extra information it gives with regards to links to your website from other people's websites. Usually, that's something you wouldn't have control over anyway. So I'd be kind of cautious about like, what you need to have there. Uh, second part of the question, is it true that the more links you have on a page, the more page authority gets divided uh, amongst the, the links? If so, is there a range to be within? Uh, so we, we do use PageRank. We don't use page authority uh, in our systems. We, we do use PageRank as a way of kind of understanding the internal structure of a website a little bit better. And it does take into account the, the links on a page. And we kind of forward the signals across these pages. Uh, but it's not the case that there's any optimal number of links that you need to have on a page to make that work well. Uh, essentially, if you're creating a website that has a reasonable structure for users where they can navigate around your website in a reasonable way, uh, then that would work for search as well. It's, and especially if you're getting started, then that's something where I wouldn't necessarily focus on like, the number of links on a page and use that as a metric uh, to try to figure out how to keep your pages running. I think at some point, if you have a very large website and Google has trouble understanding the structure or has trouble crawling it properly, then the internal linking structure is, is certainly something to look into. Uh, but especially with smaller, newer sites, that's something you probably don't need to worry about too much. John, can I ask a follow-up to last question? Sure. Yeah, uh, actually, I just want to know, like, uh, like if I am linking to uh, other pages on my website from my article, uh, does Google try to understand, like, the other article which I am linking to by looking at the uh, article from which I am linking? I mean, like, uh, Google say, like, yeah, if this is, like, 500 word text from here, you are linking to this page. So we may try to understand, like, from 500 words, uh, uh, like, get some information about that page which, uh, which I am linking to internally. Does Google do that? A little bit, but uh, not, not so much in that uh, random words on a page will in impact how linked pages are handled. Uh, so we, we take that into account uh, with regards to understanding the context of the pages that, that you have there. Usually, the anchor text is the most important part there. Um, with images, it's, it's something where we do take into account kind of the, the content around that image. Uh, so that's kind of in the direction that you're saying there. And it's less so in, in a case like that, that it's like any random text on the page will count towards that, but more it's like really around this image or around the link there, what, what kind of information is available. So for just for like better understanding the page which you like linking to, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And you you can see you can kind of guess some of this if the destination page is blocked by robots text, then there are still some situations where we would show it in search even if it's blocked by robots text, and uh, we would only be able to show it in search based on the links that we have to that page. Uh, so that's one way to kind of see, well, what, what kind of information is Google picking up uh, from those internal links? Yeah, OK, all right. Thank you. Sure. Um, my blog has been completed since two months. I posted content in January, and in starting it was an index, but now it's not in Google anymore. What is the reason for the de-indexing of the post, and how can I get it back into Google? Um, I don't know. It's, it's really hard to say without uh, any additional information there. So I, the, the one thing I would recommend in a case like this is go to the uh, Search Central help forums, uh, post your URL, some keywords that you are targeting there, and uh, try to get some advice from the community. Sometimes there are technical things that are wrong uh, on a site that you need to fix to make it so that we can index it properly again. Uh, sometimes it's more a matter of quality of individual pages or of the website overall. And that's something where the feedback is sometimes hard to take, but it's, it's sometimes really useful to get that feedback anyway. Uh, so I would make sure to just provide all of the information that you can give there uh, with regards to, to the pages, the, the rest of your site, what all has been happening there. Uh, if, if there's a 
web spam manual action that took place with regards to that page or the site in general, you would see that in Search Console. So probably you've seen that. Uh, for the most part, uh, if you're using a common CMS system, then probably the technical details are kind of OK. Uh, and it's really more a matter of uh, from the, the quality side of things. Um, our log files show that Googlebot finds a lot of JSON files, even more than normal pages. Might these kind of pages exhaust our crawl budget? Does Google crawl API routes, or uh, is this somehow internally prevented? If we disallow our API in robots text, how does that affect the XHR requests? Would they still be able to deliver content? Uh, so super good question. Uh, yes. All of these requests do count uh, towards the crawl budget. So that's something where essentially every request we make to the server that goes through the Googlebot infrastructure is something that we would count as a request that we make. I mean, it, it is a request. And we would try to limit that based on the technical limitations that we feel apply to your server. And uh, based on that, we might say, well, we can get more or we can get less content here. Uh, so in, in a case like this, you're probably more looking at the technical limitations when it comes to crawl budget and less the crawl demand side of things. And uh, it's something where if you just look at the server logs and you see a lot of JSON files that are being requested, it's not necessarily a sign that something is broken. It's not necessarily a sign that uh, the crawling is limited due to these JSON requests that are made. It's just, well, we, we happen to make a lot of these. And it could be the case that we make a lot of these requests, but we can still crawl enough of the normal content, and it doesn't really affect the normal crawling and indexing of the site. Uh, so that's something I, I would try to um, figure out ahead of time. There's no simple way to see that. There's no uh, information in Search Console directly that says, oh, you've exhausted the technical limitations that we think apply to your server. Uh, so that's something where you almost need a little bit of experience and a little bit of guessing when looking at the graphs and looking at your servers and uh, kind of testing individual URLs to figure out, is it possible that Google is running into limitations with regards to what it can crawl? Or is it possible that Google is, is like crawling as much as it wants and it's OK with that? So that's kind of the, the first step there. Uh, with regards to blocking these JSON files, if you do find out that these requests are causing problems, I mean, one, one approach is to kind of speed things up so that uh, the technical limitations are less of an issue, uh, which could be to move some content into a static CNN, some uh, CDN somewhere, uh, so that uh, those requests are easier cacheable, that they go a little bit faster than the rest of the requests to your site. That might be an option. If you decide to that you do need to block the crawling of these JSON files, uh, then you just need to keep in mind that this does include rendering of, of pages that uh, kind of try to embed these JSON files or that request these JSON files. Uh, so if there is content on your site that is only visible after rendering pages that request these JSON files, then that content will no longer be indexable because we can't get to those JSON files anymore. Uh, so that's kind of the, the downside of, of blocking things there. Uh, it's similar if other people on other websites are using your APIs and uh, kind of using your APIs to generate content for their pages. Uh, if you block those JSON files from being crawled, then those pages on their site won't be able to get that content indexed. It might be that you don't really care about that, and that's fine for you. But uh, it's, it's kind of something to, to keep in mind there. Yeah, I think Hi, John. that's pretty much it with the, yeah, go for it. Uh, yes, John. Uh, uh, we have a event discovery platform, uh, olivers.in, and uh, we are uh, facing some issue uh, related uh, duplicate canonical uh, thing. So the issue is Google is uh, picking the uh, uh, wrong uh, uh, pages instead of choosing uh, original pages. Uh, OK. 
Okay, so let let me add. I'm from the same team. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> so basically, we have all I don't know twenty thousand cities, and each city has uh, different events on them. Basically, listing the events. So uh, since a few months, we are seeing uh, Google is picking up wrong city uh, instead of other cities. Like if you search about like events in Washington, it will show result of uh, San Francisco. And when we check uh, canonical, it has picked up wrong canonical. And whole page and content, everything is different. Still, is picking up whole different city for uh, around two three thousand pages are affected like this. Okay, um, there there are two possible things that that I've seen that could could be playing a role here. Um, and the the first one depends a little bit on the way that you have your site set up. I, I didn't check uh, in, in this case. But uh, if you're using JavaScript to generate some of this city-level content, and for whatever reason we can't process the JavaScript properly, then it's possible that we see more of a generic page for some cities. And then we could say, well, this generic page is the same as that other generic page. And then we treat them as duplicates. And we pick one of them as canonicals. Uh, that That's something where you could probably recognize that fairly quickly if you use like view source on the page and you see, well, it pulls in JavaScript. It doesn't have in the HTML the actual content from, from the individual cities. You can double check some of that with the inspect URL tool as well in Search Console to see what is the content that Google picks up after rendering. The tricky part there is if it's really with JavaScript, uh, sometimes there are weird, flaky issues, depending on the server, depending on the setup that happen, where sometimes we can render it properly, sometimes we can't. And uh, that's something that's sometimes a bit hard to, to judge if that's happening or not. The other thing is if it's not a JavaScript-based site where you're pulling in the content with JavaScript, this kind of um, Duplicate uh, detection can still happen, even if the HTML content is different. Uh, so what, what tends to happen on our side is we have multiple levels of trying to understand when there is duplicate content on a site. And one is when we look at the page's content directly, and we kind of see, well, this page has this content. This page has different content. We should treat them as separate pages. Uh, the other thing is kind of a broader uh, predictive approach that we have, where we look at the URL structure of a website, where we see, well, in the past, when we've looked at URLs that look like this, we've seen they have the same content as URLs like this. And then we'll essentially learn that pattern and say, URLs that look like this are the same as URLs that look like this. Even without looking at the individual URLs, we can then sometimes say, well, we'll save ourselves some crawling and indexing and just focus on kind of these uh, assumed or very likely duplication case cases. And I, I have seen that happen with things like cities. I have seen that happen with uh, things like, I don't know, automobiles uh, is, is another one where we saw that happen, where essentially our systems recognize that what, what you specify as a city name is something that is not so relevant for, for the actual URLs. And usually, we learn that kind of pattern when a site uh, provides a lot of the same content with alternate names. So uh, with an event site, I, I don't know if this is the case for your website. Uh, with an event site, uh, it could happen that you take one city and you take a city that is maybe, I don't know, one kilometer away. And the events pages that you show there are exactly the same, because the, the same events are relevant for the, both of those places. And you take one, a city maybe five kilometers away, and like you show exactly the same events again. And uh, fr from our side, that could easily end up in a situation where we say, well, we checked 10 event, say, event URLs, and this parameter that looks like a city name is actually irrelevant, because we checked 10 of them, and it showed the same content. And uh, that's something where our systems can then say, well, maybe the city name overall is irrelevant. We can just ignore it. So what, what I would try to do in a case like this is to see 
if you have this, this kind of situation where you have strong overlaps of content, and to try to find ways to uh, limit that as much as possible. And that could be by, by using something like a rel canonical on the page and saying, well, the small city that is right outside the big city, I'll set the canonical to the bigger city because it shows exactly the same content. Uh, so that really every URL that we crawl on your website and index, we can see, well, this URL and its content are, are unique. And it's important for us to keep all of these URLs indexed, or we see clear information that this URL you know is supposed to be the same as this other one. You have maybe set up a redirect, or you have a rel canonical set up there. Uh, and we, we can just focus on those main URLs and still understand that the city aspect there is critical for your individual pages. So that's kind of the, the approach I would take here. Um, I'll also pass this on to the team internally so that they have an example of something where we're picking it up wrong and we could be doing a better job there. Uh, but I'd still try to see if there's something that you can do on your side as well to try to limit this kind of uh, overlap with multiple URLs. John, mm -hmm. can I just say and offer if you want to stick the URL into the chat? You have quite a lot of experience with geographic event sites, as you know. So we can have a look at it as well. Of course, yeah. Rishi, if you want to just paste it in. Sure, I, I just uh, dropped the URL in the uh, chat. Okay. Uh, and one more thing that I have noticed that uh, there is some pattern that the smaller number of uh, cities, like, I mean, in length, uh, like four or five character uh, length uh, cities are affected the most, uh, most instead of the larger name cities. Yeah, that's something that could also be happening there and that I mean, I mean our, our systems, when they try to understand the duplication across URL patterns, uh, it's it sometimes picks up weird, weird things there. So especially I like if you mention shorter city names and longer city names, I could imagine a, a case where you have abbreviations as well for the same city. And then we might learn, well, this shorter version is the same as this longer version. Uh, therefore, we can do that more, more likely with shorter URLs. But uh, like, I, I don't know, maybe some examples, if you could post them in the chat, then I can pick those up as well and, and forward them onto the team. Or Rob has some tips. Um, he's been working with event sites since forever. Sure, sure, I will drop some. Thanks. Cool. Um, let me just see what else we have. So I have a bit more time. We can we can hang around after the recording stops as well. Um, let's see. One one question here is someone has a bunch of XML sitemap files, and two of them have a status of can't fetch. Uh, sitemap couldn't be read. Uh, the files are valid, and uh, like why why don't they work? Um, it's it's hard to say. That's something where it would be useful to to have specific example URLs, and uh, one way you can give us that information is maybe in the help forum. So to post some of the sitemap URLs that are working and some that are not working, uh, the folks in the help forums can escalate individual issues as well, so that uh, Googlers can take a look and see if there's something on our side that's maybe blocking that as well. I, I have occasionally seen the, these kind of cases where you have a bunch of sitemap files, and some of them work and some of them don't. Sometimes they're just technical quirks on, on the server side that are happening. Sometimes there are weird things on our side that are happening. So it's sometimes useful to, to look at the specifics. Uh, one thing I, I have seen is sometimes just changing the URL of the sitemap file kind of resets uh, Google's opinion of that URL and uh, gives us a chance to take a look at the kind of new sitemap URL. So that might be a, kind of a tricky workaround. Cool. OK, uh, let me take a break here with the recording. And I'll stick around for more as well. So if any of you want to hang out a little bit longer, 
uh, or chat off the record, you're welcome to stay. Uh, if, if you're watching this on YouTube, thank you for watching. And uh, if you'd like to join one of these events in the future, make sure to watch out for the event listing on our YouTube page or uh, subscribe to the calendar that we have on the uh, Search Developer site. All right. With that, I wish you all a great weekend, and see you all maybe next time.